Our focus in this look at the book session is on verse 18 of 1 Peter 3. I included verse 17 because 18 begins with 4, or because. So let me read it in the context. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And then this is the what we're going to look at. 4. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. I'm going to stop right there because this takes us into a whole new set of thought. So all we're going to look at is that section right there. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And what makes this worth looking at with such great attention is that it tells you how you know if you've been, if you've been born again. Now, you may not see that here, but stick with me. Or... It tells us what the great purpose of the death and the sufferings of Christ are. So let me pray that God would help us. Father, are we born again? Will we enter into everlasting joy in your presence? We need to know this. And why did Christ suffer? What an awesome thing that the very Son of God should suffer crucifixion. Why? What was the big final purpose? Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the way we're going to look at this is, is simply by following the words and the logic. Those are the two main things we look at over and over again. What do the words mean and how are they put together in a certain logical way? So let's take this one at a time. Christ suffered. How central is that? We need to just pause sometimes and let the most common sayings give us a sense of profound seriousness about how, how central they are. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. The prophets inquired what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 19, you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 21, Christ also suffered for you. Chapter 4, verse 1, since therefore Christ suffered. Chapter 4, 13, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Chapter 5, verse 1, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. The point is simply that when it says Christ suffered, this is not only central to the book, it's central to the universe. So just constantly remind yourself, my God sent his son to suffer. He suffered. He suffered. We cannot think too long or deeply on the sufferings of Christ. And he did it once, not many times, which stresses how decisive and complete this suffering was. Hebrews seven twenty seven. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the people. For since he did this once for all when he offered himself. So Christ suffered once for all because his suffering did the work that need to be done. Oh, what a glorious truth that there is no repeated sacrifice, not at the table of the mass or anywhere else. Christ once for all has suffered and we get the benefit by looking to that. And what happened when he suffered? He did it for sins, namely a righteous one suffered for unrighteous. This is us and this is Christ. 
So he was perfectly righteous. We are thoroughly unrighteous. Therefore, we will never be able to be brought to God, come to God, except as judge, unless someone somehow deals with our sins who has no sins. And that's the mystery of the gospel. Sweetest news in all the world is that one who was righteous and had no sins loves us and put himself forward to take our place, the righteous for the unrighteous. So the, the, the heart, I think it would be fair to say, the heart of the gospel is substitution. Substitutionary atonement, the righteous for the unrighteous. Memorize 1 Peter 3.18. It's one of those precious verses in the Bible for these reasons. And the last thing to look at is the purpose. See that word right there? Oh, how important these words are. He suffered once in our place in order that... Now, what... What are the benefits that come from the sufferings of Christ? Let's, let's write them down. Do you want to be forgiven for your sins? That was purchased, forgiven. Do you want to be justified, stand righteous and just before God? Do you want to be free from wrath, no wrath against us, free from uh, hell, no hell, escape from hell, free from guilt, glorious freedom from guilt, and you want to have all of that be true forever? We call it eternal life. Do you want that? Of course we want that. We want forgiveness and justification and no wrath and no hell and no guilt forever. But here's the problem. All of this can be desired and lived for and died for by people who are not born again. Think of it. You don't need to be born again to want per to be forgiven. You don't need to be born again to want to be justified. You don't need to be born again to want to be free from hell and wrath and guilt and to have eternal life. Anybody who just thinks for a moment would say, yikes, I don't want God against me and want that. So being in love with forgiveness and justification and freedom from hell and guilt and wrath forever doesn't make you a Christian. What, what shows that you're born again is not that you want to be forgiven, what shows that you're born again is that you want to be with God. God. He died so that he might bring us to God. God. Bring you to God, not to be punished, but to enjoy God for pleasure. Psalm 1611 in your presence, O God, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God for our everlasting enjoyment, which means that the the, the best evidence for being born again is not that you want to be forgiven or all the things the world wants, but you want to be with God. The world doesn't want to be with God. They don't. They don't love God. They don't delight in God. They don't take pleasure in God. They get no satisfaction from God. God might be the cosmic butler to get them what they want, but they don't want God. The evidence of being born of God is that we love God. We delight in God. So honor the sufferings of Christ and pray earnestly that God would awaken a delight in God, satisfaction in God, a desire to be with God.